as far as impediments, uh, I, I, for, for us, I'd say the, the biggest issue, aside from some of the legal things we've, we've talked about and some, you know, kind of treading carefully for the time being, it's, uh, it's the technical um, challenges. It's, it's the, the constant changing of backends on Azure or the model, uh, every time the models um, advance to the, to the next um, stage, you know, some of the prompting has to be adjusted. That, that's becoming less of an issue, but, but outages, um, you know, it, I, I joke, it's like I come in Monday morning and I never know whether what I had on Friday is gonna work. And, yeah. and sometimes it doesn't. And You're not working Wednesday Saturday and Sunday, Roger? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, this, this Saturday and Sunday I did, and I had the tech <laughs> team working on problems. And, and it's just, it's frustrating. Um, we have a middle layer, so unfortunately, uh, you know, from a user's perspective, um, we, you know, the access, even via API, is not direct to the open AI models. But they go through a middle layer because we have compliance logging. Every, every prompt gets logged, every response gets logged. And so that's internally built. And again, because of constant changes and upgrades to the, 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 infra, the, the technology stack on, on our end, there's, you know, there's breakdowns. And that's, that's where a lot of the problems happen. And then, of course, there's the Azure outages. And, and you service PMs, and you know how patient PMs are when you have technology outages, right? Uh, not at all. They don't want to hear about it. Exactly. Uh, Richard, did you have any thoughts on, you know, constraints that you're seeing or feeling? Uh, for sure. I mean, I, I would say, um, to address, Roger, what you'd said before, the, the weightings, so when we scrape all this information from the web and then we train the model, um, we embed that in the weightings, right? So it's derived data, in a sense, that we're using for the models. But at the same time, there's a safety issue. So if you look at the Grok model, uh, which has le few, fewer limitations, presumably more Twitter content versus you know, Alphabet, where it's been you know, very safety constrained. Um, you do find that there's more, say, biases in one versus another. And in, 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 in both cases, different types of biases. Um, so there's that issue as well, which is kind of interesting. And then to your point about the um, different performance, we found, for example, two weeks ago, we used Cohere. AI, their model to generate citations to text. So analysts generally want to see you know, if the model makes a claim, where did that claim come from in the text? So we use Cohere, and they're the only model. Uh, until last week, there's a new model now that will do other citations. But in any case, they were the only model. They changed their model about two weeks ago, and suddenly it, things break. And you may have seen that as well, Roger. Uh, things that were you know, giving you nice, clear, crisp answers are now just sort of meandering. And, and, and this is really frustrating, especially, as I said, if we're relying on seven different models to call out to, even if they're reviewing each other, one tweak by somebody else's foundation model and they don't tell you about it can just send off the whole result. So that's one issue we're dealing with. And, and another one that uh, some Apple researchers just posted a paper, I think about a week ago, Sammy Benigo and some others, showing that in a reasoning system like uh, GPT-01, if you tweak the numbers slightly or if you add a reference to inflation last year, some extraneous information, uh, it'll offset the reasoning capabilities, uh, reduce it on average 65% across models. So the, the reasoning result is um, derailed by extraneous information, which shouldn't be happening if they are actually reasoning. And so the theory is these are not even reasoning models, they're pattern recognition models that we've just tweaked to create a, an appearance of reasoning, well, which is disturbing if we're gonna be using these for that's, reasoning. That's what they are. Well, and I don't think there's any Peter, you've written a few on. papers and you've read a few papers. Do you have any thoughts on that concept that he was referring to? Reasoning capacity, think, and is that important come, to you or not? I think it comes down to what on earth we think reasoning is. And it's, to me, it's just uh, the last couple of years have been this sort of stripping away of the onion of what we think is uh, special about humans and uh, growing recognition that a lot of what we do is a little more mechanical than we thought. Um, the sort of veneer of sophistication of the essay a few years ago, nobody thought that would, you know, people were writing books, like, you know, <laughs> critics like, um, what's his name, Gary Marcus, were writing a book, like, just three years ago, saying, oh, yeah, they can do this, but it's never going to write an essay, right? You know, here we are. So, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's harder, harder for me to cling to reductionism these days than it used to be. I used to, well, it's a computer, duh, but... But you have embedding spaces now, and you know mathematically we know you can shove um, uh, more almost orthogonal vectors into that space, and there are atoms in the universe. Right? So m machines can have these incredibly nuanced analogies and so forth. Um, it's also easy to see just mathematically that a lot of reasoning is pattern recognition, 
right? You certainly can think by pattern recognition. It's probably what we do. I think sometimes we slip into sort of level two and we think really hard when we're, you know, trying to solve a international math Olympiad problem, which, by the way, the machines can do. Um, and mostly we can't. So um, yeah, I'd say the jury's out. I mean, it's a very interesting situation we have at the moment.